Numbers chapter 13, starting at verse 25. Numbers 13, starting at verse 25. All right, I'm reading this uh, from the King James. It says, Numbers 13, verse 25, and I'm going to read to verse 33. It says, And they returned from searching of the land after 40 days. And they went and came to Moses and to Aaron and to all the congregation of the children of Israel unto the wilderness of Paran to Kadesh and brought back word unto them and unto all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. And they told him and said, We came unto the land whither thou sent us, and surely it flows with milk and honey, and this is the fruit of it. Nevertheless, the people be strong that dwell in the land. And the cities are walled and very great. And moreover, we saw the children of Anak there. The Amalekites dwell in the land of the south. And the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Amorites dwell in the mountains. And the Canaanites dwell by the sea and by the coast of Jordan. And Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. But the men that went up with him said, we will not be able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. And they brought up an evil report of the land which they had searched unto the children of Israel, saying, the land through which we have gone to search it is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof. And all the people that we saw in it are men of great stature. Verse 33, and there we saw the giants, the son of Anak which come of the giants, and we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, and so we were in their sight. Flip over to Joshua chapter 14. Joshua chapter 14. Look at verse 6. I'm going to read verse 6 through 13. Then the children of Judah came to Joshua and Gilgad, and Caleb the son of Junoth the Kenzite said to him, You know it's the thing that the Lord said unto Moses, the man of God, concerning me, and thee, and Kadesh Barnea. Forty years old was I when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to spy out the land. And I brought him word again as was in mine heart. Nevertheless, my brethren that went up with me made the heart of the people melt. But I wholly followed the Lord my God. And Moses swore on that day, saying, Surely the land whereon thy feet have trodden shall be thine inheritance and your children's forever because you have wholly followed the Lord my God. And now, behold, the Lord had kept me alive and said unto these forty and five years, even since the Lord spake this word unto Moses, while the children of Israel wandered in the wilderness, and now, lo, I am this day fourscore and five years old. As yet I am as strong this day as I was in the day that Moses sent me, as my strength was then, even so is my strength now for war, both to go out and to come in. Verse 12, now, therefore, give me this mountain. Wherefore, the Lord spake in that day that you heard is in the day how the Anakims were there and that the cities were great and fenced. If so, be the Lord be with me, then I shall be able to drive them out as the Lord said. And Joshua blessed him and gave unto Caleb, the son of Judah, Hebron for an inheritance. Um, those of y'all taking notes, write this down. Everybody has a destiny. Everybody has a destiny. Everybody has a purpose. So you can write it like this. I have a purpose. You have a purpose. Everyone has a destiny. A destiny is God's predetermined end for your life 
in this body. A destiny is God's predetermined end for our lives in this body. So no one here, no one you know, no matter what they've done, where they've grown up, choices they've made, no one on the planet is an accident or not or lacks purpose. All right. Next thing I want you to write down. You and I cannot reach destiny without vision. You and I, we, me, you, I can't reach destiny without vision. You never going to know where you're going if you can't see where you're going. Vision, you all, is the guardrail for the street that leads to your destiny. Vision is what keeps us from going off track. You ever went bowling before and you could not bowl and they put those little things in the gutter. Uh, they usually do it for kids and they do it for some of us that just can't bowl. Uh, and it, what it does is it prevents the ball from going into the gutter and makes sure the ball always hits at least one pin. Uh, that is what vision is. Vision is the bumpers in the gutter lanes of life. So that vision is what tells you who to date, who not to date. Vision tells you where to work, where not to work. Vision tells you how to operate your life so we never get off track of the road that we're on to our destiny. However, this is the, this is the truth of the matter is you and I, you can write this down, cannot have vision without a word. You and I cannot have vision without a word. And the only word that guides our vision is a word from the Lord. Look at Psalm 139, 16. Psalm 139, 16. Psalm 139, 16 says this, your eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect, and in your book all my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned, when as yet not one of them had come to pass. The message Bible reads it like this, like an open book, you watch me grow from conception to birth. All the stages of my life were spread out before you. The days of my life all prepared before I had even lived one. Look up this way. The reason you and I cannot reach destiny without vision and we can't have vision without a word and we can't have a word unless it's from God is because God is the only one who has already read the entirety of your story from the end to the beginning. He says, I am the one that works from the ancient of days. I know everything that will happen before it happens. And so who better to let spoil a movie than the one that made the movie, not just starred in it. You the star of the movie but God wrote the movie he produced the movie he directed the movie and so he knows how the story ends even when we do not this means that even though you may love uh, T.D. Jakes you may love Daryl Scarborough you may love Kevin you may love all types of people that speak into your lives if someone speaks into your life and they're not speaking out of God's word and is not confirming what God has spoken to you then you have to begin to say I need God you to speak into my life because you are the one that knows my story better than anybody else. That's why you cannot compare your life to other people's lives because you don't know their story. So before you decide you want to be like so and so, you want to sing like so and so, you want to preach like so and so, you better make sure you done read their whole story because you don't know what you're stepping into. Your book might be a horror story but it might be better than theirs. Are y'all with me? And so you have have to be able, watch this, to get your vision from the God that wrote your story. 
The reason it has to be a word, watch this, 1 Samuel 3 and 1. 1 Samuel 3 and 1, turn to it. 1 Samuel 3 and 1. Can't have a vision without a word. The word has to come from the one who wrote the book. First Samuel chapter 3 verse 1 says this, And the word of the Lord was precious in those days. There was no open vision. Without a word from God, you and I cannot have a vision that leads us to the destiny God has for us. Let me say it like this. You and I can't come up with our own vision. And you don't believe me, look over your life. You've done it before. And look how that turned out. Half us in this room right now because we want God to undo the stuff we came up with. Lord, if you would just fix <laughs> this thing that I done broke. Uh, turn to Proverbs. Proverbs 29. Proverbs 29 and 18. Vision, vision. Proverbs 29 and 18. This is why we look in the scripture. So y'all know I ain't making it up. Proverbs 29, 18. You got it? Says this. From the King James, it says, where there is no vision, the people perish. But he, but he that keepeth the law, happy is he. Now, in the King James, is re it reads another way. It says, uh, where there is no vision, the people perish. Watch this. Or are made naked. Where there is no vision, the people are, as we used to say, naked. N-E-K-K-E-D. Where there's no vision, the people is naked. So let's say it like this. When you and I have no vision for our life and have no vision for the church, we are as ones that walk around naked. What does that mean? It means we walk around exposed. Vision, you all, is the covering that protects us from the elements we have to walk through on the way to destiny. It is vision that keeps you, yea, though you in the valley of the shadow of death. Because vision is not confined to the environment you're in. What do, what do you mean, preacher? It, it means in Chicago, this is the thing I like, I like, I prefer cold weather to hot weather, all right? Kevin loves hot weather. He loves, the hotter he is, Kevin is happy. Uh, I, I don't like hot weather. I prefer cold. I, I, and I'm going to tell you why. Because it can get colder and colder and colder. I can always put on more clothes. Some of y'all are going to catch it in about five seconds. I, I, I can always put something else on. But it's a point in hot where ain't nothing left to take off. And if you ain't got your body summer ready, <laughs> you're going to be exposing some stuff. Ah. Vision, watch this, always will allow you to put more on than you got to take off. And so it covers us. Well, watch this. This also reads like this in the, in, in the Amplified. Proverbs 29, 18 reads like this. Where there's no vision, no revelation from God or his word, the people are unrestrained. The Hebrew word, y'all, perish, it, it, it is, is pronounced para. And the word in the biblical proverb uh, speaks to a woman's hair that is let flow out of its covering. So it, it, it's ladies, when you take your, your headband off, your hair thing, the hair tie, when you take that off, 
and you go like this. Whether it's your hair or not, if you pay for it, it's yours. It's just, it's, it, 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 it's when you let your paid hair fly. It, it is the picture, watch this, of unconstrained hair in the wind that is directionless and blows in all directions. Where there is no vision, the people are directionless and blow in every direction. If there's no vision for your life or for the church, then your life and the church will always be going in a million different directions. Watch this. And in today's culture, because we have made diversity the new sexy name and word for the church, everybody wants to do everything to attract everybody. Watch this. When every church ain't called to attract everybody, but watch this, a type of body and not a look of body. And so we have become so wired that we want to please everybody that we become directionless because we have no vision you cannot have a vision and be all over the place but vision has to give direction and clarity watch this that means when you establish vision some people ain't gonna stay with you because some people love directionless you some people like unrestrained you. Some people like the naked version of you because your nakedness and unrestrained and directionless makes them feel better about their nakedness and their unrestrained and their directionless. They ain't your friend. They are your co-conspirator and that's why they never want you to get any plan for your life because if you get a plan for your life, then you know they don't fit in your life. That's why sometimes, whether it's it's your church, whether it's your mama, whether it's your granddaddy, sometimes the shoe don't fit Cinderella and that's okay. Take that glass slipper off your foot, go back to your house and do what God told you to do and stop worrying about what every Tom, Dick and Harry says about you. You got to have the unmitigated call to stand on what God told you to do. Watch this because the directionless people ain't going to like you no way. That's what happens in Numbers 13. This is what happens in Numbers 13. Let's go back to Numbers 13. Numbers 13. Now, in Numbers 13, when you get to just sit there for a second, in Numbers 13, God has already promised the children of Israel the promised land. It's called the promised land. He t it, it, it's it's self-explanatory, right? He's got a huge label on promised land. He said, this, this is y'all. This is what I'm giving to you. Now, he pulls them out of bondage. All right, keep looking straight ahead in case you, you feel yourself. Just, just look so we don't know. He pulls them out of Egypt. Jailbreak, and he does it in a crazy way. I mean, 10 plagues and, and, and locusts and water turning to blood and just all kind of crazy. He pulls them out. And now, mind you, when they were in slavery, they kept saying, when you going to get us out of slavery? We, we, we tired of being in bondage. Get us out of here. God shows up. He pulls them out of there, and they walk in, and they walk in, and they walk in, and they get to a point where now God is hardened Pharaoh's heart, and the enemy is chasing after them. And so now they are standing between a mountain and a sea, and the enemy is behind them. They don't know what they're going to do. They complaining like, you know, they ain't, ain't nobody here. Y'all don't do that. They start complaining. Uh, Moses can't believe you brought us out of here. This is just stupid. Why are we out here? You know, this don't make no sense. Where are we going to go now? How are we going to get across this big old sea? And then God shows up again. And God says, you know what? And he parts the Red Sea. And they walk across the sea. And now they're walking across the sea. Now, mind you, they're walking with a vision. They have a place to go to, right? They know where they're going. And so God has only taken them a little bit out the way to get 
get to it so he can show them that he still is the way and they ain't got to worry about a particular way as long as they follow the way. Many of us get so stuck on formulas that you got to keep doing it a certain way and you don't realize that you are skipping the way to do it another way when the way is the only way to get to where you got to go because the way is the one that called you to where you're going. And so they got to go a little bit around the way, but they go around the way and the way makes a way out of no way and they go through the ocean and they go through the ocean on dry land and then the enemy is chasing them. All of a sudden, all the stuff that they walk through comes down on them and so they're on the other side and God is doing some amazing things in their life. He's feeding them every day. They got all kind of stuff falling from heaven. They got manna. They got pancakes from McDonald's every morning. Every morning, they got pancakes from McDonald's. They ain't got to order it. They ain't got to go through the drive through It is right there. But do you know what they do in typical church folk fashion? Why we only got bread? Why we only get pancakes? Where the bacon at, God? Where the bacon? Why we can't get no bacon? We can't get no sausage with these pancakes? This how you going to do us, pastor? You going to bring us from one place over here and just keep giving us biscuits with no syrup? How fun is that? So God says, you know what? Y'all getting on my nerves. He tells Moses, go tell these trifling folk that they can get some meat. If they want some meat, I'm going to flood them with meat. So he piles up bacon all the way to the sky. And they go find the bacon. But don't shout too quick. Here, go find all the bacon. And everybody that ate the bacon ends up dying. They get sick. They get sick because they ate too much bacon. Now, this is why. Watch this. Because you can't go from a diet of all one thing and then introduce something else. Watch this. You don't understand that sometimes the very thing you keep begging God to give you is not something you are wired to handle. But God will say, you want it? I'm going to let you have it and let you be sick on the stuff that you keep asking for. Watch this. That have nothing to do with where I'm taking you. The food was irrelevant to their destiny. Why are you asking for a car now? She ain't lying. And then you keep getting pulled over in the spirit for driving illegally. Now you, and they sitting there, stomach hurt. They done died off. And now you get to 13, and in 13, God did not tell them. Understand this. They spy out the land. And it says, the Lord spake unto Moses, verse 1, chapter 13. Send men that they may search the land of Canaan and give it to the children of Israel. And every tribe of their fathers, you shall send a man, every one a ruler among them. Understand this. This wasn't God's idea. This was the tradition of where they usually handled conquests. And they wanted to spy out the land. God didn't need them to spy out the land. Because he had already checked out the land. Why God need you to go inspect what he's already approved? So his grace, because God is gracious to us, because he know we crazy. He says, y'all what? Y'all go ahead. Send, send some folk out there. Go, go look at it. So they go look at it. These fools come back. <laughs> Drop down. Where we started, verse 25. And they return from searching the land for 40 days. And they come back to Moses. Now, I'm paraphrasing a little bit. Come back to Moses and to Aaron, pastor and assistant pastor, and the whole church. And they say to the church, pastor and assistant pastor, deacons and elders, ushers and greeters, this is the fruit we got. Woo, some good fruit over there. It's a nice, nice group of people over there. A whole lot of churches want to move to places where people have more money. Uh. The income is higher over there. Nicer cars over there. We ain't got to worry about nobody breaking in our building over there. Look at this. Look at these demographics. They are amazing. But right across the street is some homeless people. 
Right across the street is some thugs. Right across the street is some drug addicts. Right across the street is a, is a playground where homeless people gather and the kids run amok and their parents aren't around. Right across the street is some bad schools. So while it's some rich people near one side, the other side is not the best. The Amalekites dwell in the land on the south. The Crips and the Bloods dwell in the mountains. The blacks and the browns dwell by the sea. We don't, we don't, we don't, they, they got too much extra with them. And then Brother Caleb, who was working parking, comes in and stands before pastor and the church and says, forget all that. We can do this. Now watch this. This ain't, this, ain't, this ain't here. And we ain't never been to no church like this. But then the deacons and the trustees come up and say, but what about them thugs? What about them crackheads? What about our safety? We don't know about going in them schools with them bad kids. And now watch this. They don't present it like Caleb presents it. Caleb says it to everybody at one time. But the text tells us that the other ten went and started gossiping among the congregation. Uh, Keep looking straight ahead. This ain't got nothing to do with you. Just do that, do that. It's a doggone shame what people do. <laughs> and they start giving another report saying we cannot handle where we are called to go. Because, watch this, not because the giants were giants, but because they saw themselves as grasshoppers. How your vision is with yourself can magnify what God has already minimized. When you hang with people that have sight but no vision, they will always create another vision, which was where you get die vision because there are dual visions. And now the visions have to compete. But guess what vision will always lose? It's not the vision with the most votes. It's the vision that God sides on. When you get a vision for your life, listen carefully, you cannot let the peanut gallery dictate what you do with what God told you to do. Of course they think what you up against is bigger than you, fool. That's why I go up against it because greater is he on the inside of me than anything that's in the world. You may be scared of Goliath, but I ain't scared of no doggone ghost. Give me a ghostbuster and I'll take down every single thing God puts in front of me watch this cause that's where he called me to you ain't ready to be a Christian if you're afraid of controversy you ain't ready to be a disciple if you're afraid of fighting and confronting stuff God looking for crazy people see see here we I, I can't talk for nobody else, but we, we don't need nobody that's scared to touch stuff here. I, I, we don't need nobody that's scared of smells here. We don't, we don't need nobody that's worried about all. God got you. You weren't worried about nothing when you was in that club all night. You know how many times you've been roofied?
You know how many times you walked through danger when you were living it up, when you were drunk, when you were kicking it in the world, and you never paid attention to anything around you because it was the best night of your life? Well, let me tell you something. This is the best season of your life. And if God be for you, who can be against you? Watch this. Listen, listen. Watch this. Be careful of peanut galleries. Because peanut galleries will lead you off of your path of destiny. Look at Numbers 14. Numbers 14, verse 1. Why are you doing all that? Because you ain't. You should take a break. Why? You ain't even started. Numbers 14. Maybe I won't have to do so much if you joined in. Oh, the congregation. Verse, Numbers 14, verse 1. Y'all okay? Oh, okay. We're going to get a little bit bumpy for a second, but we're going to come back. It says, and all the congregation lifted up their voice and cried, and the people wept that night. Look up this way. First thing, let me say this. You know it is a vision from the devil if it leaves you weeping and in tears. Congress lifted up their voice, cried, and people wept all night. Verse 2, and all the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron. They, they talked about the pastor and assistant pastor. I need to get an assistant pastor. Somebody else to get talked about. <laughs> and the whole, was, and the whole church said to them, would God that we have died in the land of Egypt? Or would God, we had died in this wilderness? Why did God bring us here to fall by the sword for our wives and children to be a prey? Was it not better for us to go back into slavery? And they said to one another, Let's get us another pastor that's going to take us back into slavery. The Bible says that in the last days, people would heap upon themselves preachers that say what they want to hear. We have moved into another place in the world where you have the church begging to go back to the joys of slavery. So instead of, watch this, the struggle we don't know, we want to stay in the bondage we do know. Moses and Aaron fell on their face before all the assembly congregation children of Israel. And Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of Judah, which were with them to search the land, tore their clothes. If the Lord delight in us, then he will bring us into the land and give us the land which floweth with milk and honey. Only rebel not against the Lord, neither fear ye the people of the land, for they are bread for us. Their defenses departed from them. And the Lord is with us. Fear them not. But all the congregation talked about stoning them. And the glory of the Lord appeared in the tabernacle of the congregation before all the children of Israel. And the Lord said to Moses, how long these people are going to work my nerves? And how long will they not believe in me? For all the signs which I have shown them. Watch this. Listen carefully, y'all. There is a difference, hear me, between constructive input and complaint.
when you have a vision for your life, let's talk about our individual lives first. You know there are folk around you that will say, maybe try it this way, and you realize, oh, this might work better. This might be a, a different way to approach this. And say, Okay, cool. But then there are them other people, the peanut gallery, that never have a solution, but they got a million problems to tell you about. Girl, I don't know why you're doing all that. Them kids is bad. Them kids are trying. I don't, just, I don't know why you over there. I don't know why you, man, bro. I don't know why you. I don't know why you put up with that. I don't know why you put. Up. I wouldn't put up with that for my woman. But you could put up with that. You crazy. I would never put. You ain't had a woman. <laughs> I'm on my fourth girlfriend. You ain't had one in ten years. In this text, I want to give you this. I want you to consider this, that maybe, because God's issue with them is that they don't trust him. When it comes to having vision for where God has told you you have to go, we have to understand that complaint is the prophetic voice of distrust. Complaint is the prophetic voice of distrust. When we start complaining to God about where we are, we tell God we don't trust him. And when you open your mouth to declare you don't trust him, you have just prophesied a new vision for your life. You do not believe me, so I'm going to show you what God said. Go back to Numbers 14. God says, uh, I'm so sick and tired of them. He did. He says it. He says, verse 20. Oh, where is it? Verse 20, Numbers 14. And the Lord said, I have pardoned according to thy word. But truly as I live, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. Because all those men which have seen my glory, my miracles, which I did in Egypt and the wilderness, have now tempted me now these ten times. How many times have you tempted God? And have not hearkened to my voice, voice, vision. Surely they shall not see. The land which I promised to their daddies, neither shall any of them that provoked me see it. God says, watch this. <laughs> Keep on talking. You, you, you don't want to do what I told you to do for your life? Okay, keep on talking. Keep on not giving me praise regardless of where you are. Keep on not praying regardless of what's going on in your life. Keep on not worship me because you don't like your situation. Keep on, keep, keep on, keep on if you want to. Keep, keep on not giving me what I've given to you anyway. Keep, keep on not sharing what ain't even yours in the first place. Keep, keep being stingy if you want to because you don't like your lot in life and you don't like the hands you was dealt with and you don't like how people treat you right now. Keep, keep on doing that if you want to. You're going to fool around and prophesy another future for your life and not because I don't stick with my promise but because I'm going to let you get what you ask for I know I know I know hold on we almost we almost through it so now he says all you jokers ain't gonna see it but these two Caleb and Joshua watch this who saw what I saw listen carefully Vision is seeing what he sees. It's not making up something. Any choice you and I make against the vision God has given you for your life, and we're talking about individual, is a vision that will send you to another future that you have created. 40 years later, 
Joshua 14. All them folk, ain't none of them made it. Joshua's there. Caleb's there. Joshua says, y'all, you, you got to remember what God has said. The crazy thing is, watch this, look at Joshua 14, verse 1. Verse 1 and 2. Flip to it. We're almost done. Joshua 14, verse 1 and 2 says this. And these are the countries which the children of Israel inherited from the land of Canaan, which Eleazar are the priests, and Joshua the son of Nun, and the heads of the fathers of the tribes of the children of Israel distributed for an inheritance to them. Verse 2. By lot was their inheritance, as the Lord commanded by the hand of Moses, for the nine tribes and for half the tribe. Now, check this out. They drew lots for the land. Now, this is not the text that says you can play the lottery. This, this is not approved the casino as a place of worship. All right? I know some of y'all go there to evangelize. Uh-huh, right, yeah. No, no, you go for the buffet. That's what it is. Go for the buffet. Go for the buffet. I know, I know, I know. You just happen to win some change. Watch this, though. Even though they are drawing lots, and it seems by chance, God is still very much in control. He's so much in control because his promise never fails to come. His promise, watch this, is what uh, the lots fall in. The lots are contained, the lots and the drawing, the things that seem random to us, all sit in the realm of his promise. Nothing, you all, just happens. When vision is the perspective, then we understand that even when things seem up to chance, they are not up to chance. It would seem like it was up to chance, but God is the one that was doing the deciding. Some things in life that seem they are by chance are not out of the reach of God's providence. And often, you all, it is our interference in the things we can't control that ends up messing up stuff because we assume that God does not control everything. But the truth of the matter is God controls every single thing. Even the flip of a coin toss at a football game is not chance because it's being thrown into the wind he controls and pulled by the gravity he controls onto the grass that he controls on the earth that he controls. Ain't nothing by chance chance everything sits in the hand of his providence this means you all that even when it comes to us as a church we know God has called us from a place even Bishop knew years ago that this was not boss's permanent home that means that's in God's hands but watch this we still have to make the effort to go look for what he is going to reveal to us that means just because God controls all things it does not mean we get to be lazy and sit back and wait for him to do what he said. No, this is a participation sport where you and I got to get our tail up and go do for God to show what we are called to do. Watch this. Stop complaining about the hand you've been dealt in life and figure out what he wants you to do with the hand you've been dealt. It's when God reveals a place. One of the things we looked for when we were looking for a place is not just for God to reveal it, but when he revealed the place, is there a vision for the place? When he shows you something, watch this, he's got to show you what to do with it. Some of us, God showed you your spouse, but you waited, you moved so fast, you never got the memo on what to do with them. Don't mean the job is from the devil, it just means you skipped ahead and didn't read the instructions. 
I knew the Lord told me to buy the bookshelf from Ikea, but God also told me I should have read the directions before I tried to put it together. But I just looked at the picture on the box, tried to throw the thing together, and oh my God, a week later, all the books fall off and the whole shelf falls down. Why? Not because the shelf was demonic, not because I wasn't supposed to have a shelf. It's because I didn't read the directions because God reveals a thing, but then he has to give you a vision for the thing. They divided the land. Listen carefully, y'all. God commands this church to say, wherever I send you, you have to divide the land among my people. What does that mean? That means I'm not giving you anything for you. I'm giving you something for them. And if you are selfish with what I'm giving you for them, I ain't giving you nothing else. Let me tell you a secret. Some of us are broke, not because God ain't gave you nothing, but because you don't give nothing. And before you get all tight and all bothered, oh, I said, come church, I always want to talk about you giving money to the church. You don't give money to nobody. You don't share nothing. You don't give a ride in your car. But then my car broke down. God, why you won't do nothing with my broke down? You don't use it for nothing. You want a house, but you don't use the apartment for nothing. You want a better job, but you don't bless nobody. You see that it's struggling, but you want to say, God, give Give me more. Give me more. God did not give this church anything ever in its history because we were givers. He gave it because he knew what we would do with it. They didn't divide the land based upon skin color. They didn't divide the land based upon perception. Land wasn't divided based upon sex or age. Land wasn't divided based upon where they grew up. It's imperative, boss, that the church always move to provide and incite biblical equality in the giving of resources and relationships. To declare that we are the body of Christ and be okay with our brown brothers and sisters being treated any kind of way. To say we're the body of Christ and be okay with black boys being killed in the street. To say we're the body of Christ and be okay with women being treated as property and discarded as such. To say we're the body of Christ and be okay with anybody living outside. Then something is wrong with us. Matter of fact, if we proclaim boldly that we attend a diverse church but nothing in our life outside of this Sunday is diverse, then I need you to sit down and be quiet. I know it's harsh, but I'm sick and tired of seeing these homeless people. And everybody got these nice church homes. I know it's harsh, but I'm sick and tired of us pretending like black boys and black men are not being hurt and hunted down in many regards. I don't care who the perpetrator is. If it's them themselves, it's not of God. I don't care. I know, I know, I know. I can see it in your face. Some of you are like, oh, it's getting tense. And yes, it should be tense in here because we cannot say we are the church of the living God and be okay with any brown-skinned person being threatened to be kicked out of a nation. We should not say we are the church of the living God and be picking a political political side over the side of our God. We cannot say we are the church of the living God and be okay coming in a building with lights on and nice seats when you don't walk past 15 homeless people and ain't thought nothing about them. But we got the audacity to come up in here and ask God for more land and more house and another car. And God says, you ain't done nothing for the folk that I've called you to, but you keep asking me for more stuff. That is not the vision of God for his church it is not the vision of God for his church for us to sit back and keep our mouth shut when there is injustice in the land it is not the vision of God's church for us to act like we are diverse when really we live under an umbrella of racism pretending to be diversity and there is no unity in the church it is not God's will that we sit up in here and shout and roll on the floor and let men die in jail and we never go to see them what what you've done to the least of these. Give me a 
church that will call right, right, and wrong, wrong. And right ain't determined by where you grew up. Right ain't determined by your skin color. Right is not determined by your bank account balance. We keep asking for more stuff. And that is not our destiny nor his vision for your life. Oh, God then brought me out of all this stuff. Do something with it. How long you gonna keep whining about where he, oh God, I'm going through all this. How long you gonna keep telling the same story and do nothing with it? Let me say this and I'm done. What time? Let me say. Your testimony in here is cool. It's cool, it's cool, it's cool. It's, 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 it's not wrong telling your story in here. Your testimony in here gives us reason to praise. Your testimony in here gives us reason to worship. And when we do that, God inhabits the praises of his people. He steps down. Miracles, signs, and wonders take place. People get set free because you can say, you know what, I've been through this, I've been through this. And we say, oh, my God, that's amazing. I trust God to do the same. That's cool in here. But your testimony carries a greater weight out there. We don't need more preachers in here. We need more preachers out there. We don't need more worshipers in here. We need more worshipers out there. And you got many folk in the church that have been so indoctrinated into the cult of the church, yeah, I said that, that you only want to serve in here when the destiny of your life is out there. Because the only way your tail got in here is because somebody was out there. Oh, let me say it again. You want to only do it in here, but you got in here because somebody left in here and went out there. Where did he find you? Where he find you at? Where he found you at might be where you need to be going. The vision of the church is not to add services. It is not going to be anywhere in our plan presented for business meeting. The next year we want to purchase a smoke machine. We are not trying to set aside money to get laser lights. When we could be setting aside money to support folk like our own Lorraine Pryor who goes to schools after school defending kids that are being unjustly accused of stuff. Oh, I'm sorry, no, she's not an usher. Oh, no, that's not parking lot. We could be setting aside money to support Pastor Taper as he goes into jail after jail to minister to men and women that are locked up. We should be a church that we give so we can go. I don't even know how I got on this. I'm about to... It is not Ooh. God did not save you for you to do this.
weeks of your life you're going to do that. And if that's your stilo, yeah, I said stilo. There are places that would allow you to be comfortable doing that. But God did not call Bishop Sherwood Carson to start a church to be like every other church. And I have a doggone show, no. God did not move me across the country to do church like every other church. Kevin can testify. God ain't called him across the country to just do the same old, same old. I could have stayed where I was. Before you look at me crazy, you could have stayed where you were. You ain't have to get out the bed this morning to come do the same old thing. But there are men and women that are dying every single day out in those streets. And you keep waiting on somebody to give you a title inside the church. When God is saying, I've called my church outside of the four walls. The only reason I'm giving this church another property is to do greater kingdom ministry, not to live in the property. Don't tell me you're an ally and you never show up for the work. I'm a partner. Are you? Because you seem more like a shackle. Oh, I said it. Yeah, I said it. I said it. I'm telling y'all right now, over the next 90 days, we're going to spit fire. Because every last murmuring, complaining folk that ain't called to the promised land with us, I need you to go on about your business. Y'all clapping like I'm joking. Pratchett Pastor, what do you mean? Don't tell me you're an ally. And you never use your privilege to help somebody that's less privileged? You love Jesus so much, but you let the same homeless woman sit by your job and you ain't never fed her. She keep asking for money and I don't want to enable her habit. Feed her. Maybe, oh, maybe, maybe it's crazy idea, crazy idea, crazy idea, crazy idea. Maybe she wouldn't still be addicted if you use your super anointing and sat down next to her and laid hands on her. But you so doggone scary that she smelled funny when you don't remember the days when you looked funny and God still. Yeah, I want to hurt your feelings. It's all going to shame all these boys out here running amok. You a grown man, dog. Go talk to them. Oh, but you don't want to tell nobody. Your real secret is you grown, but you scared. It ain't that you ain't got time. You scared. <laughs> That's why your anointing only works in here. Because it's safe. You so anointed. So much glory on you. Your worship is for real. Go stand in front of one of them bad schools. And lift your hands before God. And let God step down and change the school. You big baller shot caller, you know all the politicians. You know all the basketball players. 
your boy play for so and so. We'll pay for the rims for the boys to play. So they ain't got to pay to play someplace else. Baller. Let me say this, y'all, and I'm done. It's okay. Hear me. It's okay. If you be like, man, you know what? This ain't, this ain't my thing. I just want to be chill. I want to chill out in church. I want to get a nice little word and be able to make it to Sizzler on time. I just, just want to be. <laughs> ain't nothing wrong with that. I promise you. Nothing's wrong with that. But let me say this to y'all. God needs every one of us to do what he's calling this church to do. That means some of you, he has financially blessed you to support and fund. Some of you, he's given you books to write. Some of you, he's given you amazing concepts of art and creativity to draw artists and draw artistic people. Some of you, God has given you boldness that you can talk to anybody, anytime, any kind of way. God has given some of you the heart to just be bold. Some of you, God has given you an amazing business mind to be able to look at stuff and say, this is where money can be made. This is where we can make profit. This is where we can do this. There has to come a point where there is a gathering, watch this, thank you, Holy Ghost, where there is a gathering of all the individual visions so all the individual visions from the corporate vision you're gonna catch it in a second there is not one individual vision in this place that God has given you that does not have a place in the corporate vision of this place or God would have never called you to this place if God did not call you to this place then that's why your vision don't match this place and you need to find where your vision matches so we can all go on about our lives and do what we are called to do. Now, I'm not saying that say that I don't want you to be here and I want you to leave because I know some of y'all like, he don't want me here. He want, I ain't even talking to you. I don't even know who you are because I don't even know that that's what you are thinking. There's 600 people in this room. I don't know that you are thinking that, so I'm not talking to you. So if the shoe fits Cinderella, there you go. But if it's not fitting for you, then you know what has God called you to be. What that means, you all, is boss is moving into a season where our vision it's going to be streamlined with clarity and we need everybody on the same page so we can make an impact in the world like God has called us to make an impact. That means some of you going to go out, some of you going to stay here, some of you going to fund it, some of you going to be it, some of you going to talk, some of you going to listen, some of you got business, some of you got genius. That's what that means. So the question comes this, what is God's vision for your